Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Benjamin Quinn, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm so excited to welcome you to tonight's event with Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz discussing her latest book, Not a Nation of Immigrants, Settler Colonialism, White Supremacy, and a History of Erasure and Exclusion in conversation with Walter Johnson. Tonight's event is part of our ongoing virtual event series. As we remain digital for the time being, we're so excited to continue the work of bringing authors and their writing to our community during these difficult times. Especially now, it is through the support of authors and our beloved readers that we can continue to make events like this happen. So thank you so much for showing up for us week after week. For tonight's event, we will conclude with some time for your questions. If you would like to ask the speaker something, locate the Q&A function wherever it may live on your Zoom display where you can submit all your questions. We'll get through as many as time allows. If you go to the chat section, I will shortly be posting a link to our website where you can purchase your own copy of Not a Nation of Immigrants. If you already have a copy of the book or would like to contribute to this series and our store in a different way, I will also be posting in the chat a link to our website's donation function. We greatly appreciate any and all support you are able to extend to us at this time. Please note that closed captioning is available for this broadcast. Depending on which version of Zoom you are using, you may need to enable it yourself. Simply locate the button marked live transcript on your display and click through all the options. And one final note, as you have no doubt experienced during virtual gatherings this last year, technical issues might come up. If any glitches do occur, I will do my best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you so much for your patience and understanding. And now it is my sincere pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz has been active in the international indigenous movement for more than four decades and is known for her lifelong commitment to national and international social justice issues. She is the author of eight books, including her foundational study of the Great Sioux Nation and 2015's An Indigenous People's History of the United States, which was the recipient of numerous honors, including the American Book Award and the Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Award for Excellence in Literature. Tonight, she is joined in conversation by prize-winning historian Walter Johnson, the celebrated author of Soul by Soul, Life Inside the Antebellum Slave Market, and The Broken Heart of America, St. Louis and the Violent History of the United States. As a professor and an activist, Johnson is a founding member of the Commonwealth Project, which brings together academics, artists, and activists in an effort to imagine, foster, and support revolutionary social change. This evening, these two brilliant historians join us for a discussion of Professor Dunbar-Ortiz's latest book, Not a Nation of Immigrants, a vital and sweeping re-examination of America's history and one of our most pernicious falsehoods, which Barbara Ransby calls a must-read history for our troubling present. We've all heard it, an adage we've seen emblazoned on headlines and viral images and blocky text and in fine print. We are a nation of immigrants, a repetition that serves to not only counter whatever violent xenophobe crowds our pulpit, but to reinforce the dishonest notion that we are living in a land of equality and opportunity. As she did in an, an indigenous people's history of the United States, Dunbar Ortiz rewinds the clock, exploring America's history of genocide, white supremacy, slavery, and structural inequality, and charging that this feel-good statement is more than just a benign comfort, but is an ideology which obscures the violent truth of this nation's founding. We are so honored to be hosting this event tonight. Without further ado, I'm now delighted to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is all yours, Roxanne and Walter. Thank you, um, Benjamin, and uh, thank you, Roxanne, for inviting me to do this. It is a very great honor. Um, it seems both uh, necessary and utterly insufficient to begin with a land acknowledgement. Um, we're gathered today on the ancestral territory of the Massachusetts people. Many indigenous communities have lived and moved through this place over time. And so we recognize also the Wampanoag and the Nipmuc people among others. Indigenous people from many nations live and work in this region today. And so I ask you to join us in acknowledging their communities, paying respect to their elders past and present and recognizing their active presence and their futurity proposed in the generations present and those to come. We affirm indigenous sovereignty and will continue to work up, to, to lift, to work, to lift up indigenous voices. Roxanne, it is, it is so good to see you. It's good to be in your intellectual company. It is wonderful to see you at this moment, having been 
in your intellectual company over the last several days as I read this book, um, calling people, texting people. I'm not sure. I think it will be sometime before you are actually welcome in my household because my family members are tired of being assaulted with your book. I've been like following them around like some kind of crazy evangelist, <laughs> waving it at them and telling them things. So thank you for this. It is, I mean, I, I, it is both exciting and humbling always to, to read your work because there's so much that I learn that I feel like I should have known earlier. And so I want to, to both, I guess, um, confess that and, and also just to thank you for it. I thought that um, maybe we could start with a short reading from, from the end of the book, which I think is, is both very powerful and very crystal clear um, about your purpose and your hopes and um, very hortatory. So maybe you could start, um, you have the book in front of you, right? I mean, I see you got one behind you, so you're not gonna get out of this. Um, page 281, where with the sentence that begins, uh, this book is a call for all those. Well, thank you, Walter. It's my honor to that you um, are in conversation with me as you, as I've told you many times, you are my favorite historian. I love your work. And we were here last year at Harvard Books, remember with your new book that I came out on St. Louis. So it's good to be with you again and thank Harvard Bookstore and Benjamin uh, for hosting us and thank everyone for joining us. So I'll read from the end of the book, you asked me to. So this book is a call for all those who have gone through the immigrant or refugee experience or are descendants of immigrants to acknowledge settler colonialism and the Americanization process that sucks them into complicity with white supremacy and erasure of the indigenous peoples. It's a call too for descendants of original settlers to understand and reject settler colonialism and the romanticizing of original white settlers who were instrumentalized to reproduce white supremacy and white nationalism. It's a call for those who work tirelessly for workers' rights and working class solidarity to recognize that it's not only racism that divides the working class, but also the effects of settler colonialism. It limits workers' identification as even being working class and worker solidarity in the US and with other workers of the world. The European model of a proletarian revolution challenging, much less overcoming the US fiscal military capitalist and imperialist state has not and will not work as such. A revolutionary working class must be able to acknowledge its enemy and eschew not only capitalism, but also colonialism and imperialism. Given the long history of the United States demand for unquestioning patriotism and the contingency of citizenship that immigrants experience, there is a deep fear of appearing unpatriotic. Not only immigrants, but also descendants of enslaved Africans experience the contingency. When the San Francisco 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick kneeled during the national anthem to protest racism and police brutality, he felt it necessary to declare his patriotism following the game saying, I'm not anti-American, I love America. Despite his expressed patriotism, Kaepernick was ousted from professional football and his former fans burned their Kaepernick uh, jerseys during the national anthem. 
U.S. President Donald Trump said that a player who kneeled during the anthem was a son of a bitch. James Baldwin felt obligated in his notes of a native son to declare his patriotism, say, writing, I love America more than any other country in this world. And exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. perpetually. Though not expressing patriotism can be deadly, Black Panthers who boldly told the truth about the United States were imprisoned and killed by police. The world famous opera star, Paul Robeson, who was black and openly leftist, was driven out of the country in his career. American Indian movement activist, Leonard Peltier was imprisoned for life for the death of two FBI agents, a crime he did not commit. Jobs and careers can be crushed. Running for public office is out of the question. U.S. leftists have long compensated for their critiques of U.S. capitalism and imperialism by waving the flag or celebrating, say, Tom Paine. At the end of World War II, the U.S. Communist Party was at its height of respectability, having been the driver of the success of the New Deal reforms and workers' rights. But their usefulness had run its course and communists and other leftists were subjected to prosecution and fired from jobs. Even tenured university professors were ousted and civil service workers purged. To punctuate the terror, the government executed Julius and Ethel Rosenberg in a very public burning. Even after the firing of all federal civil servants and private sector employees suspected of being Reds and cleaning out Hollywood, FBI agents appeared at their homes or new places of employment if they found work, followed them in unmarked cars and made their lives and that of their children miserable. Perhaps that is one reason so few US historians are willing to risk their careers by writing US history objectively. Even Howard Zinn's 1980 book, A People's History of the United States remains eschewed by most professional historians. And in September, 2020, the book was publicly condemned by then president Donald Trump, who introduced an initiative to require the teaching of patriotic history, saying the left wing rioting and mayhem are the direct result of decades of left wing indoctrination in our schools. It's gone on far too long. Our children are instructed from propaganda tracks like those of Howard Zinn that tried to make students ashamed of their own history. Perhaps more, most important of all, this book is a call to acknowledge settler colonialism and to put away the myth that the United States is a nation of immigrants. As, uh, as Mahmoud Mandani insists, the US autobiography must be rewritten. This is a project that cannot be left to professional US historians. It will require that all oppressed people and educators take history into their own hands. They must dissect that history, rewrite and disseminate it. The United States will not decolonize until it is forced to do so. And unless colonization and imperialism are understood to be inherent in the founding and all US institutions, we cannot begin to dismantle the fiscal military state. Thank you. Um, I was struck just, I mean, I was struck anew by several things as you read, but I was really struck at the end by the United States will not decolonize until it is forced to do so. And what seems to me to be a, an echo there of CLR James and the Black Jacobins about the rich are only defeated when running for their lives. Um, this is a very, very serious book. This is a very critical book. It is a book that is critical of many of our, our pieties, our national pieties, many um, subtle truths on, on the left as, as well as on the right. And so I, I guess I want to, to begin by um, 
having you talk a little bit about what 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 were you frustrated with what were you worried about when you sat down to write this book and 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 what do you what do you want people to come away with um you know what, what do you want people who identify very strongly as immigrants to to understand um, what do you want, you know, people who, who suppress their own self-understanding as, as settlers and yet kind of continually recur to it? I remember, you know, I mean, I'll just, I guess, throw a little bit of a memory, actually. I remember growing up in, in Missouri um, in the wintertime. And, and my mother, who was a, a wonderful woman and a very politically awake woman but every time the wind would start to howl she would say i wonder how the native americans lived here and so there was a sort of a you know a a uh incomplete recognition of replacement and settlement that the that, that she read from the landscape every winter and so i guess i'm i'm just wondering where you want to begin, where you would begin to have a conversation with someone like my mother, who I guess stands in for me in this formulation. Well, I bet your mother comes from old settler stock, though, probably. <laughs> here in I, I, don't, I, you know, I don't even want to go into that tonight, Roxy. <laughs> I, I, I definitely um, make a differentiation between See the not in um, the nation of immigrants makes everyone an immigrant. Alexander Hamilton in the musical is, is an immigrant, right. and of course they were settlers. You know, so it's a complete denial of. And you and I, I mean, you know, my Dunbar family, um, and most of both sides uh, come from you know are Scots Irish, and uh, most of us in the South. And I mean, this is Oklahoma, but they originated up in Appalachia and I have a big part on Appalachia and, and that's the kind of heartland of settler colonialism uh, even today and a romanticizing uh, uh, of it. Uh, the original pioneers who think they're, they are the indigenous people, they're original settlers. So this, um, what I wanted to do is really make that distinction between a settler. In some ways, I had wanted to write a book about settler colonialism. There are some really good books out about settler colonialism. And I have, I, there's, there's nothing I can add. These, these books are excellent and a whole journal called Settler Colonial Studies. Anyone has access to them. I want to put it within the context of this idea of a nation of immigrants and, and distinguish that really, you can't even talk about immigration until the 1840s when the Irish famine refugees showed up. And even then they were refugees, they were starving refugees. There were no immigration laws and they were blue eyed blonde and spoke English. So they were they were processed pretty quickly, even though they came from you know resistance, uh, colonialism. They're colonized people, um, and uh, Republican, and retained some of that, but also you know became put it within the Americanization context. So when you say processed, you mean processed into whiteness. I, yeah, literally, I feel uh -huh. like these people were put through the grinder uh -huh. immigrants. I mean, I didn't have, I didn't know this until I started really deeply researching the experiences and reading a lot of memoirs to what people have to go through, just that citizenship test they have to take and all the patriotism and everything and how they have to behave, you know, and why people are so scared in this country, you know, really, really scared. They feel contingent. We don't, those of us who come from, you know, the settler, we never feel contingent, probably should, but, you know, really you don't. It's like, well, this is, you know, we were always here, we weren't immigrants. so. 
I grew up like you did probably with a lot of German uh, immigrants around. And many of them were very prosperous. They were small farmers, you know, I mean, not super rich or anything, um, but, but they were so, and many of them were Catholic. And of course the Czech and the Polish and all were Catholic. And so they, they really were, um, they were persecuted for being Catholic. We were all Southern Baptists, you know? So, mm -hmm. uh, and Catholicism was uh, the work of the devil. So it, you know, even white Europeans uh, who were, uh, did well, you know, um, and came in the, in the 19th century, um, have to go through this and it replicates itself through the generations. It's kind of an intergenerational trauma of immigration. But when I got to how, you know, first the Irish being processed and the kind of jobs they could take, they were very, very poor. So they took the worst jobs, digging ditches, coal mines, um, working on the levees, building the canals, the railroad, but they also took jobs in slave patrols in the South. And um, they took, and then they became the police. <laughs> I had one, you know, I posted on Facebook a question when I started the um, Irish uh, chapter and um, asked, did anyone have any suggestions? And of course, everyone came up with no Ignatius, uh, um, how the Irish became white. And, you know, I say how the Irish became settlers. Um, and one, one person posted, I'm pretty sure she, it was a woman's name. Um, I have my Facebook page open to everyone, you know, not close uh, to just friend. Uh, so all kinds of people post and some really good suggestions, you know, for articles and reading and ideas and everything, but a lot of romanticizing. Mm -hmm. Oh, the Molly Maguires, all the, you know, this really romanticizing uh, the Irish. And this one person who I believe was probably a black woman posted, they became white when they became the police. Mm -hmm. So this is this process of their being in gangs you know, the gangs of New York, that, that movie portrays that, and Boston, um, Philadelphia, New York. Um, they then, this is a, when police forces, modern police right, right. first being formed. So they are also in the clan systems, you know, related through clans and all. So one would get hired and then they would get their clans uh, relatives hired. <laughs> Yeah, let me, let me, so, I mean, I, th I think a, a lot of what the book shows us is, is it, it, there's an, that you're trying to, to, to hold two things together. And one of the things is about the constrained possibilities of freedom in the United States, which you, you epitomize that argument, I think, with this beautiful quotation from Lisa Lowe about every pathway to freedom for every immigrant pathway to freedom is also a burial of freedom because it depends upon the erasure of Native American people, Native American history. It depends upon genocide. And part of that's just about the structured possibilities that people pursue. But there's also, I think, an argument about complicity about people making choices. And, and I guess I'm interested to hear you think back and forth between those two ideas, between the limited structures through which freedom in the United States is available to access, but also the ways in which you um, write with, and I think speak with a, a, a voice of moral reckoning for people who choose the pathway of, I guess, identifying with or fulfilling their sort of settler destiny. Yeah, I think, um, you know, immigrants, when they started coming and, it, 
you know, it was really in the 1870s, 1880s that, that the non-English speaking Eastern and Southern Europeans started coming and were really the other, they were Catholic and Jewish. The Irish were Catholic, but they had this, you know, advantage of, of speaking English. Um, so you, this is when you really see the Americanization process coming through. And I have a whole chapter on the use of Columbus, which was a lot of it was new to me, the research, because I just had him, you know, as first column, you know, as the as the uh, the symbol of uh, of European colonialism, since he was you know the first discoverer, um, and you know uh, um, we've been able to almost totally demolish him, including all of his statues. <laughs> but um, but he, I I didn't realize how I thought it was something kind of more recent, you know. Um, and, and you know, very Italian, but I couldn't understand the Italian connection. Here you have, you know, these absolutely incredible ancestors. I mean, the best artists in the world, and sculptors, and musicians. And they all. They, why would you pick Columbus as your identity? Mm -hmm. I mean, then on the left, there's Sacco and Vanzetti. You know, there's there's, or if you like. If you like crime, there's the mafia, you know, there's anything but Columbus, you know. But what I realized is this, this was very purposeful. And it was Theodore Roosevelt who had a big role in it. He was a, you know, he, he was a Anglo-Saxon only, only Anglo-Saxons uh, were uh, pure race. He had a whole racial code, you know, and the very bottom were Native Americans who were scum, not really human. And, um, but this was a reality, uh, you know, when he got into politics that an industrial machine was at work and all these Catholic, uh, non-English speaking, uh, non-Anglo-Saxon people had to somehow be brought in. So he uh, worked with the Knights of Columbus, which formed in 1770, I mean, 1872, 1882, sorry, in preparation for the 400 year anniversary of Columbus. So this was made into, you know, the white city in Chicago and made into, so they offered to the Italians the idea of being descendants of the first American, they called him the first American, Columbus, the first American. Literally, they, they almost named the United States Columbia. This was before the country of Columbia was established. They discussed it, but instead they just named the Washington DC District of Columbia. But almost every state, the first town they set up is Columbus or Columbia. And, and including well, I, I am, I am of course from Columbia, Missouri. Right, exactly. Um, and, you know, and I think one of the things to me that was so interesting about the book is that the, the different chapters treat different episodes, but they're also very, very situated. And so you have a chapter that is effectively about Ohio. And it's about the Northwest Ordinance and the origins of the land survey as being in Ohio, and also about the first wave of genocidal Indian wars being in the Ohio Valley. There's one about um, the border in Mexico, Texas, California, the, the sort of large border complex. I want to hear you talk for a second about Appalachia, because I think that it, it relates to what you were just saying about Columbus and to your idea about what you call settler self-indigeneity. And in a chapter that ranges from um, James Fenimore Cooper to J.D. Vance. And I think that, that maybe sort of that, that argument will, you know, rehearsing that argument for our audience will help them understand both kind of your, um, your intellectual style, but also what it is that you're, you're getting at in, in the book. 
Yeah, I've long been interested in um, Appalachia as a um, as a kind of the heartland of settler colonialism, and because my Dunbar family came from there, and it was. I was raised with such a formation of the importance of the Scots-Irish, you know, because 90% of the uh, of the white people, which are 90% of Appalachia, uh, are from Scots-Irish heritage. And tell, then they, tell everybody real quick what that means. Well, these are the co colonizers of Ulster, uh, the main colonizers, the British, um, had Wilch and Anglo settlers, they decided on, they had already colonized Ireland uh, administratively, of course, for two centuries. But Cromwell decided to, um, uh, to take Protestantism to um, Ireland, uh, as he is a Protestant, and uh, get rid of that evil Rome Catholicism. So they chose the Northern, they only got as far as Northern Ireland in the settler colonialism, uh, but they, uh, the Welsh, the, the um, Anglo-Protestant, Anglo but it was mainly the Scots um, who, well, there were plenty of Catholic Scots too, but, there, uh, but many were Calvinists, you know, Calvinism started in Scotland. Uh, with John um, uh, and in France, of course, the Huguenots. So that was um, the process of, of uh, creating settler colonialism, the first act of creating settler colonialism. Then many of these, many of them uh, started coming over um, to North America colonies in the early 1700s, a few came in the, you know, in the in the 1600s, but mainly Anglo's were coming now, uh, and a few Ger and some Germans, of course. But the Scots, uh, Scots Irish settlers started coming in fairly great numbers, and by then, most of the uh, the arable lands were taken mainly by you know large plantation owners. Uh, in the south and in the north, it had become more populated and, and there wasn't much there. So they started going illegally. It became illegal. Um, the British proclamation of, you know, after the French and Indian War was to prohibit any, any migration of the settlers and, and bring them back. That, that's why they declared independence because they wanted, you know, the the elite of the uh, the colonial masters uh, wanted to take the continent uh, and wanted to keep expanding as the British Empire. But if they couldn't do it as the British Empire, do it as as the American Empire. So they started trekking up into, you know, uh, Daniel Boone's famous for this. He was Welsh, uh, but of course Protestant. And uh, Calvinists, you know, hard shell Calvinists uh, that took other names like Methodist and eventually Baptist, Southern Baptist, and so forth. And they started, and, and it was, they were in native territory. This was very densely populated, uh, the Shawnee people in particular, but Cherokees. Cherokee um, land base was huge territory. And they were just, and they lived in villages. They were farmers who lived in villages traditionally, you know, for 10,000 years, the native people. They weren't just, you know, people, scattered people running around in the, um, in the woods as uh, it was all manicured. So what they did was appropriate, simply drive, viciously drive out people, farmers aren't known for being, you know, warriors, <laughs> warrior classes. Um, and you take the land, burn down, you know, burn down their villages or, and then appropriate what's already developed. You know, they, they didn't start from scratch by any means as it's, uh, 
the romanticized version of Appalachia, these, these poor settlers, you know, Scots Irish settlers who went into the wilderness and there was no wilderness, you know, it was all manicured, it was all, you know, native, um, uh, old native habitat, you know, from uh, eons. So this was, you know, this pushing them into, into marginal areas. And this, of course, continued with, with the, um, you know, with the revolution, uh, the counter-revolution, as, as Gerald Horn calls it, of, of independence. So they they became the um, sort of idealized um, the Scots Irish. They idealized themselves, you know, both as Calvinists, as uh, some of them became very famous, like Andrew Jackson became a big slave owner in Tennessee and president, you know, general and then president. Um, so this was, this, these were the, um, the people who really created the form of settler colonialism that then got institutionalized with the Platte system, with the Northwest Territory, because this is where they were already, you know, so it was basically, implementing and, and um, their actions. And they were seasoned settler colonials because they had done this, you know, or their ancestors after a while had done this in, in Ulster, Northern Ireland. And of course we know that's still an issue. You know, the, the Protestant, the, uh, the Calvinist Protestant, uh, it's a 50-50 population. They never completely outnumbered the Irish Catholics, but enough to keep it separate from the rest of Ireland and um, with the English overlord. So this is still with us today. It's not as if it, and so Appalachia is a kind of replication of that. And then these people, like my own father's family, the Dunbars, started migrating first to Missouri. They followed Daniel Boone. You know, Daniel Boone died in Missouri. A lot of people don't know that. They think he, you know, just up in Appalachia, but but he led people out, you know, to before Missouri was even a part of the United States, they started settling there. And so my you can trace my Dunbar family following Daniel Boone into Missouri. And then when Oklahoma opened for settlement. Indian territory that was supposed to be forever and ever for all the relocated, you know, 50 some nations uh, forced, uh, forcibly relocated from east of the Mississippi uh, to what became Oklahoma. Um, then they went there, then they went to California, the Dust Bowl Wookies were like 80% probably the Scots Irish settlers. And so they're everywhere now. <laughs> You know, so one thing that, that, that strikes me, I'm, I, I only have time to ask you one more question and then we're going to throw it open. But one thing that strikes me about the way that you talk about the book is the extent to which you're talking about it as part of your own family history. And in a way that helps me understand um, the astringency of the book. Because I know you to be an enormously generous person. And what I understand here is that the level of, of rage and astringency in this book is partly coming out of your own reckoning with your family's past. And I think that that to me is actually a very important moral aspect of the book is that it's not that you're like hanging out in San Francisco, you know, <laughs> critiquing, you know, critiquing everybody from the heartland, right? And so you're saying this is my history and, and I want you to understand. I think that's, that's an important aspect. But what I want to ask you about, I, I have tons of questions and I was going to ask, Roxanne's been doing this for weeks. And so I was going to ask her a set of questions about, you know, what question were you able to avoid over your entire book tour that, that you must now answer. But, but I think it's really important 
to discuss the distinction that you make between arrivants and immigrants and for you to, to explain what that's doing for you. And then also moments where you think maybe that the, both of the, you know, the, this distinction between arrivants and immigrants sometimes breaks down under the pressure of this sort of settler, of people getting processed into settlerism. Yeah, certainly the Irish refugees were arrivants, um, you know, but they did get processed. But the the core of arrivants, uh, and I take that term from a you know Caribbean um, poet actually, uh, who created it to describe the um, contingent uh, position of of enslaved Africans, and. Um, that they're certainly not immigrants. So, you know, they're brought in chains, uh, strapped uh, on their backs and the bottom of ships and then seasoned and then sold on the auction block. So this is not, it can never be characterized as immigrant or settler. So there's this zone, you know, of um, arrivance. And I would say, let's say the Vietnamese refugees who came or Cambodian, um, that in refugees in general, and if you really get down to it, um, US wars have created many people we call immigrants are actually <laughs> arrivants, you know, that they had little choice uh, of what to do or Haitians, do they really wanna live in the United States or do they wanna be able to feed their family and send to help family back home, you know? Everyone's not just dying to live in the United States. It's just this, this is wealthy place with lots of uh, jobs and um, many of them, you know, uh, most of them very, very uh, degrading and poorly paid, but des only desperate people would, would do that. So, um, so I, I settled on that term, I got it. I got it through Jody Bird, this wonderful uh, Chickasaw uh, a scholar at University of Illinois, um, whose uh, book, A Transit of Empire, I recommend to everyone. I use, I use her book a lot, and both you know, in indigenous people's history and this one, uh, it's just brilliant. And she explains in her introduction, the, um, the use of the term, uh, arrive at. And she extends it to, you know, refugees and others who are not really choosing to, they're not settlers and they're not choosing to, to come. Um, I suppose the early indentured servants would be that, but generally though, they were able to, you know, once they lived out their contract of whatever years, they could become settlers you know, get land and um, um, so- the, the, the pathway to freedom is yeah. settlerism. Exactly, how to become a settler, how immigrants become settlers and how, uh, I was very encouraged reading memoirs of um, uh, settlers from, you know, after 18, um, 1965, finally they opened up, you know, uh, Fewer quotas uh, uh, opened up more to non-Western European uh, immigration. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have people from Africa, Asia, more Chinese. A lot of people were coming before, but they mostly were undocumented and illegal. Uh, so those who've come since 1965, written, you know, they come as children sometimes and they grow up and they write a memoir or they come, you know, even as adults and, and write. There's some really a great literature of these memoirs that I read. And I find them very cognizant, the third world uh, immigrants of native people, they exist. Uh, that's because native people have, re you know, have, have, have done things that make them more visible Mm -hmm. since the 1960s. So in the past, they could, you know, be ignored completely, but 
the land struggles, uh, the pipeline struggles, and I'll have put, you know, put it on the map and things like Wounded Knee, uh, Standing Rock. So they take notice and I, uh, and they say they feel, they feel uh, conflicted, you know, coming uh, to a settler colonial. They don't always use the terminology of settler colonial. Um, but it's that's encouraging, I think. And it's I didn't know that till I read the book. I mean, until I was writing the book and read these. And so I have a lot of, uh, you know, quotes from them. And um, also their difficulties as as people who are non non Caucasian, you know, white Anglo Saxon or Scott Parish. Um, they 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 have lots of problems. Um, and uh, of course, the border is very central. I have two chapters on the border. Uh, one is historical uh, US invasion, occupation of half of Mexico, and then one is more current. Well, right. And, and you, I think, treat the US Mexican War in the 19th century as an anti Indian war. Yeah. And I think and treat um, the legacy of of xenophobia directed at Mexicans as part of a kind of a settler anti Indian violence, which is in, enormously important for for the um, trajectory of the book. But unfortunately, for the trajectory of our event, I think um, we need to open it up to questions from the <clears throat> audience. Audience members, if you have questions, you better ask them because otherwise I am going to make Roxanne answer the question, what is the question that you most feared that you have not yet been asked? All right, so we have three in the queue. Um, as Walter says, everyone please submit more, but I'll start with this one, um, which I think gestures to the, the quotation in your title, the quotation marks. Could you talk a bit about the development of a nation of immigrants as a sort of encapsulating slogan? Were there any deliberate attempts among brain trusts throughout the United States history to steal ideology towards this? Yes, that, that's a really good question. Uh, the first, the introduction to the book, I traced the origin. I honestly didn't know when I, I was kind of raging against the idea of the nation of immigrants uh, for a long time. I wrote a, a kind of a blog, it used to be a called blog back in 2005 for monthly review. Stop calling this a nation of immigrants. I called it a rant, you know, it's kind of a rant of why it's not true. You know, Mexicans aren't immigrants, uh, black people aren't immigrants, and certainly not indigenous people. So who's an immigrant? And, but it wasn't until um, the, the Hamilton the Musical, which is a nation of immigrants spect spectacle, it, it encapsulates that I really I said I have to write a I have to write a book on this, and I started researching. And to my surprise, I didn't know this myself. Maybe other people do, but I didn't know that it was invented by John F. Kennedy in 1958. He published a book called A Nation of Immigrants. It's still a bestseller. It's come out in hundreds of different versions with different introductions and conclusions. And it was partly because he's Irish Catholic, child of immigrants and Catholic, and that never happened before. Every single president ha had been Protestant and, and either um, Anglo or Scots-Irish, not even German, you know, and um, uh, so he had a, a hill to climb, you know, to overcome, uh, overcome this. And he barely won, you know, against a descendant of old settlers. Um, and some think he didn't win, <laughs> but Mayor Daly gave it to him. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, he became president, but he, um, he invented the terms so I uh, tell about that text is very interesting. It's mostly about the Irish famine refugees, of course. And um, he, he actually calls uh, uh, Native Americans the first immigrants. 
he invented that. And all of this showed up in textbooks. By the 1990s, when I was getting angry about it, it was showing up in textbooks, not referencing him, but referen having you know the first chapter in a uh, school textbook on US history would be the first immigrants because they have native people coming over the Bering Strait Therefore, they're immigrants. Uh, oh, yeah, it was 20,000 years ago. But <laughs> anyway, uh, when you know people were migrating around the world, getting settled in. Um, so this was interesting, you know, and he actually uh, repeats a legend that the people who came, the native people who were here when the Europeans came, were not the original people, the Aborigines, that these people had invaded and killed off the Aborigines who may have been Europeans. And so he has Europeans coming back to their homeland. <laughs> so I'm sorry, this sounds crazy, but <laughs> it's an interesting little book. <laughs> Thank you so much for the, all that information that I did not have prior to that. That's so mind blowing. Um, so this question I'll switch to came in during your discussion of arrivals versus immigrants. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to expand it a little bit more. But so the questioner asks, I'm so glad you brought in the ways that settlers brought over a number of religious doctrines, including Calvinism and other Protestant movements and sects. Is there a connection between this image of the good and virtuous settler um, and some of the ways Christianity frames a good person? This idea of, of like, we're all good people, sort of, if that makes sense. I think that's what they're asking. <laughs> well, of course, Calvinism was, you know, they don't like to talk about uh, Jamestown much. The first, <laughs> 1607, which is a bunch of mercenaries and just killing Indians and bringing almost nothing. Uh, at all, but um, but sixteen twenty, you know the 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 whole maybe it was worse when I I was studying history in the sixties and then graduate school. But this this almost solemn um, reverence about the Puritans and the Plymouth and the Calvinists um, that um, Perry Miller and others that that. Uh, that is still very strong. You saw it in, well, you know, there wasn't much, all that much celebration last year during the pandemic. I, I was glad to see it blown away, you know, the Plymouth, um, <laughs> the anniversary of the <laughs> Plymouth. It, it, they had all kinds of plans that, you know, had to be shelved because of the, the pandemic. But, um, that reverence for Calvinism, you know, is the, and of course I grew up uh, Calvinist Southern Baptist based in the Calvinist tradition, Methodism, you know, all of these, you know, most of the evangelical, uh, uh, like 60% of the U.S. population <laughs> have the, you know, some form of Calvinism. It, it morphed into different kinds of, um, uh, you know, uh, denominations. But there's still this this um, this Calvinist thing of actually you're very um, inherently evil, but you can be blessed. It's ar pretty arbitrary who is the chosen, but it manifests itself, and um, you know it's a good capitalist um, religion too, uh, born with capitalism. Um, of uh, wealth seems to shine a light that might mean you're probably a chosen person. So it's so tied up with, and the United States was founded as the first capitalist republic, capitalist state founded as such. Um, and, and this is woven into it, the Calvinism is woven into it and into the constitution of, um, of you know being chosen and of course the people who are most chosen are the descendants of the original people so 
immigrants come and they have no idea about any of this, much less that it was, you know, a densely populated continent of, of Native nations. How are, how's anyone supposed to know? You know, it's not taught in the, in the schools, but I think Calvinism really is so woven in the culture that you don't have to be religious to carry it around. I mean, I'm sure I do because I was brainwashed for the first 17 years of my life uh, in the Southern Baptist. And even though I threw it away, um, it, it, it definitely had, you know, has a hold on me in terms of self-criticism, you know, and doing the right thing and not making mistakes and judgment, you know, judgment, being judgmental, uh, mainly about myself. So it makes a very cranky nation, I think. <laughs> is, is that your next book title? <laughs> the Cranky Nation. A cranky nation. Yeah. <laughs> a nation of cranks, I like that. Right <laughs> oh. um, so I think we have time for our last question, um, which says, I love your book and your work, Roxanne, because it asks settlers to reckon with our own personal history, but also to understand that the notion of settler colonialism goes to the very foundation of this country from the moment of its inception. What would a process of decolonization look like for a country that is imperialist to its very core? Well, that's really, really a good question. Um, <laughs> I have pondered ever since I became a, a wild-eyed revolutionary in the 60s, uh, how on earth, and I didn't know uh, nearly how difficult it was then, you know, what I, what I, came to know. Um, I think that, you know, things are happening uh, and things happen to empires. Uh, I mean, it's kind of a cliche, you know, the rise and fall of empires because I think too many people think it will just happen automatically and suddenly, um, suddenly it will no longer be like, British Empire, but England, you know, and, and having actually uh, uh, inherent kind of changes, but it's a, it's actually a, a long process. And we know rural Britannia, you know, still has its, <laughs> has its uh, um, Brit Britex and, you know, it's, it's, it's forces. And, and so imperialism is, um, you know, it's very deep and, it's also more engaged in a, you know, a republic, a democratic society. Most imperialism were monarchs, you know, in the beginning. So the United States was really the first um, uh, empire builder that was a republic. Uh, France soon became, you know, similar, uh, similar when they overthrew the monarch. Um, so it's 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 so deep in the marrow of um, uh, of everyone in the country is it's normalized. So I think decolonization means denormalization. We have to, um, uh, and how that turns around, I think native scholars, uh, I've learned so much from uh, native scholars in the past uh, 40, 50 years um, that, that I really recommend that everyone uh, Look at say Jody Bird's uh, work, uh, uh, Nick Yesis, Melanie Yazi, uh, so many um, uh, hundred different uh, Ojibwe um, uh, scholars. Universities have now Native American studies everywhere. There's University of North Carolina, University of New Mexico, Nebraska, Oklahoma publish um, Native authors that. This um, scholarship and, of course, settler colonial uh, studies is, is I, I think, is, is spreading, you know, into uh, American studies. Uh, history is always, as Walter knows, a hard nut to crack, 
uh, for any, any kind of change, but it, it is kind of infiltrating into history of graduate students. And um, so I think that that's at you know, one level, but those things end up getting into textbooks eventually. I mean, less and less since Texas controls mainly the textbook market, it's kind of difficult uh, for things to get. But teachers are very smart these days, I found uh, with my indigenous people's history, I, I, I met many, many teachers and it got, you know, it got um, adapted as a young people's book and these educators are really hungry for books like this. So they can adopt, you know, books and do lesson plans and use books. So um, I think it has to really, really start with education and the younger people, if they don't already know these things, it's just, they're so open to, it doesn't at all make them hate themselves <laughs> to, to know the truth because, People go around confused in this country all the time, you know, really confused because there's so many lies, you know, just the reverence for the constitution, you know, that's a Calvinist thing, you know, this, this is like the Bible, you know, it's a fetish, this fetishism and around the Supreme Court, and we know the Supreme Court was corrupted under the Jackson administration, you know, when he overruled it. And went ahead and removed the, the Cherokees when they said no, three decisions, you know. This, he said, you know, Mr. Marshall, uh, I have the army. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have words. So um, it's, you know, the corruption that we then are, you know, as purified in the education. And so I think that's very, very education just, you know, I've devoted my life to education, Walter has and others. And I think it's so important um, uh, to also be in dialogue with, with K to 12 teachers. Well, and, and, the, and the rage comes, I think you have attested tonight and I think I would certainly attest, the rage comes when you find out you've been getting lied to. Right. I mean, Absolutely. That's, that's when the rage comes. Yeah. For me, when the Baptist, you know, I was so angry when I, um, it was someone, uh, was really questioning me about the Bible. The man I married, he said, you know, uh, he really knew the Bible. He was an agnostic, but he knew the Bible. And he said, um, uh, I, I was, you know, anti alcohol. That's a sin to drink alcohol. And he, he drank beer, Oklahoma was 3.2 beer. Um, and I, I was very upset. And he said, well, what about the, the wedding party where Jesus turned water into wine? And I said, that wasn't wine. That was unfermented grape juice. And that's what the Baptist had told me. And he laughed. He fell off his bench that we were yeah. sitting on laughing, rolling. And I thought, it was like a house of cards. The whole thing came falling down. Martinelli's wasn't going to hold you anymore. Huh? That's, that's great. Yeah. Um, I think we're out of time, Roxanne. And it is, it's just always a pleasure to talk with you. I, you know, I miss seeing you in person. I hope I get to see you soon. And um, I'm grateful for your intellectual company and for your moral example, um, you are a, a, a pole star for me. And so it's been a real, it's been fun to hear you talk. And I have really learned a lot um, from the last several days I've spent with this book. I urge everyone to have that experience for themselves. And I, I thank you. Um, I thank you for your time tonight. Well, thank you, Walter. And, um... Of course, your books are so important to me. I used River of Dark Dreams uh, on almost every page. <laughs> yeah, you hear that, man? Get that stuff in the chat. <laughs> oh, oh. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> I'll try to. <laughs> and, and thanks, uh, Harvard Bookstore, for hosting us. Yes, and um, thank 
thank both of you for this fantastic conversation. Um, thanks to all of you out there for spending part of your evening with us. Um, please learn more about this incredible book and purchase Not a Nation of Immigrants at harvard.com. I put the link to purchase in the chat a couple times. On behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, enjoy the rest of your week. Keep reading and stay safe. Thank you both again. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank <laughs> you.